Speciesism and Disability, a story about a disabled dog, a duck, and a woman who cared for them. I would like to start my story with an anecdote from a different talk about ableism and speciesism I gave a while back. The discussion moderator, someone um, who I personally admire, had prepared some questions for me and prefaced the, discussions with, the discussion with um, a kind of self-deprecating sentence along the lines of, oh, I'm not good with big words and maybe I'm too stupid, before they continued to ask me actually really interesting questions about my work. And this stuck with me as I felt kind of great shame for, for making anyone engaging with my work feel inadequate by using these kind of big words, um, which I interpreted as inaccessible discourse, perhaps designed to gatekeep knowledge. I'm sure some of you have encountered similar sentiments to your work, especially if you present outside of universities where people are still kind of less afraid to admit that they don't know something. Or perhaps you have also made a little self-deprecating joke before posing your question to a panelist at a conference. On a side note, uh, more often than not, it is younger activists and thinkers who are not men that feel the urge to introduce their line of thought when engaging with academic work with a sentence that positions their curiosity and intelligence hierarchically lower to that um, of, of the author of said work. Uh, regardless, it was not until that recent talk where I started wondering why I was still kind of perpetuating the very thing that made me, made me leave academia behind. The rigid way of producing knowledge and scripting thought that allows Eurocentric ableist society to ascribe social and monetary value to my writing and speech. Why could I not present my thoughts and texts uh, the way that comes naturally to me and makes them more accessible to others and myself? It occurred to me that in my academic work, like in many other areas of my life, I was masking. Masking is the effort of neurodivergent people put into presenting and passing as neurotypical and non-disabled, so as to avoid exclusion and discrimination. We hide the nature of the way we express ourselves cognitively, verbally, and through our bodies uh, by adapting it to dominant neurotypical styles of communication that are rewarded by ableist society. When I am not masking, I communicate in a non-linear, more intense and urgent way, perhaps, especially in verbal interactions. I often find it hard to focus on more pertinent aspects of the point I am trying to convey, and I give a lot of seemingly irrelevant context. This is often an inconvenience to neurotypicals participating in a conversation with me, because I am now dedicated to unmasking and exploring my Id idiosyncratic style of communication. You are officially warned that you might be in for a ride with my talk today. But instead of wondering where the ride might be taking you and where it might end, I invite you to engage with each sentence and each word as you receive it. I invite you to leave behind the rigidity, rigidity of an introduction, a main part and a conclusion, and feel free to pick and choose what is relevant and significant to you at any given time. Dislodge my words as far as possible from, from a wider context of meaning and try to refrain from categorizing and comparing what I communicate to signifiers that you already are familiar with. So this talk is about ableism this system of oppression that di discriminates against disabled bodies and minds, a system that removes them, removes us from society, while simultaneously examining us, opening us up, cutting us open, scanning our bodies and seeing into our brains, so as to identify and name us, to pathologize, medicalize and assimilate us. I will also speak about speciesism, the system of oppression that discriminates discriminates against those categorized as animals or those who are not considered human enough. Individuals that are assigned species other than homo sapiens, but also individuals categorized homo sapiens who might be dehumanized in the dominant sociopolitical context, including disabled people. The questions I want to explore today surround the idea of moral consideration. In Eurocentric capitalist patriarchy that I am part of, who receives and who distributes the, the right to aid, care, love and dignity? I reflected on these questions in a chapter for, for the book Disability and Animality, Crip Perspectives in Critical Animal Studies, um, edited by Chloe Taylor and Stephanie Jenkins and Kelly Struthers Munford. And I would like to read um, and kind of adapted a few paragraphs 
from that. So this is the text from the book. Uh, it was the end of summer when I was introduced to Nika, who had suffered a stroke during her journey from Romania to, to Germany, having been crammed into a trailer amongst many other much bigger dogs who had nowhere but the trailer to relieve themselves. Ever since the experience, she was struggling to walk in a straight line or stand still. She could reach her water bowls, her water and food bowls only with great difficulty. During the first few days living with this dog, who, due to a veterinarian's estimate, we were expecting to die any minute, my emotions alternated between admiration for those kind-hearted hum hearted humans who took this old disabled dog into their care and strong doubt regarding the quality of life she had. I almost instantly became aware of the ableism that produces both of those feelings. Similarly, finding out how to relate to Nika was hard at the beginning for two reasons. Firstly, I had never cared for a dog with whom I could not communicate by decoding typical behaviors such as tail wagging, their tone of voice, and uh, their ear movement. I knew getting to know her would take more time than it would take with the other dogs that also lived there. Secondly, the social contract between me and my new housemates, whom I was also getting to know at the time, made it hard for me to voice any suggestions regarding Nika's care when I first moved in. Although we shared common anti-speciesist and anti-capitalist values, uh, my feeling of living in their house and relating to Nika as their dog initially prevented me from acting fully in accordance with my own moral compass and capabilities when caring for Nika. Soon, however, we developed a bond and I became so friendly with Nika that the human part of our household came to consider Nika as my dog and me as her human. It was not, not long until my housemates entrusted me and my partner as well with the care of Nika. And the more time I spent with her, the more I picked up on, on the ways, uh, on her ways of communicating with me, uh, which she would do through subtle gestures of lifting her front paw when wanting to get out of bed or smacking her lips when wanting to drink. Whereas, uh, we, used, uh, whereas we were used to other dogs making themselves perceptible to us, very overtly, we had to make ourselves perceptible to Nika and pay the greatest attention to her gentle communication. This is why Nika was medically categorized as a dying dog, even a dog not worth keeping alive, perhaps. Uh, she could not have, she could not care for herself and she could barely ask for help from humans. As a dog, Nika was firmly integrated into, to, into the production of meaning as a signifier for man's best friend. Nika raptured this clear-cut purpose of us having a dog. She could not fulfill the role of a happy-go-lucky, frolicking in the backyard, interacting with other dogs and humans. Instead, she was utterly dependent um, on us humans. It, this made it very easy for outsiders to comment on our keeping her alive for no purpose, and tying the purpose of Nika's existence completely um, to the entertainment of humans that they could no longer see her providing. This logic assumes that the purpose of a dog's existence lies only in their relation to humans. Nika's role as a valuable part of the community in our household and her intrinsic value were lost on anybody who could not perceive her without animalizing and objectifying her existence. When, Nika, when, Nika's, hind legs, when Nika's hind legs weakened, she used a wheelchair, which gave her stability, the stability that she needed to walk straight. Now, um, what was really interesting, however, is that prior to this, Nika had been constructed as a kind of poor dog who was suffering, suffering under my inability, inability to let go of her um, and kind of suggesting that we should let her move on and, and yeah, put her down, as, as we say. In her wheelchair, however, her presence in public had a very different effect on people. She was fetishized as cute, strong and a little fighter whereas people met me with admiration and compliments for being kind and empathetic. The same house share was also home uh, to many other animals, including a dozen ducks. ducks. They had their own fenced off area in the yard, uh, which they could leave, a pond and a shed to sleep in, as well as two lakes very close to the house, actually. Despite that, the ducks stayed in the yard where they enjoyed regular guaranteed meal times and relative safety. 
After an attack by predators, however, one duck, one duck was badly injured, suffering from an open wound under her wings and immobility. Her wounds were deep and her legs seemed broken as she slid across, across the ground. The responsibilities we as humans had towards this duck were not as obvious to us as they were with our canine, canine companion, Nika. In this system of signs and meanings that I have learned, ducks represent kind of wild animals who in general are far less exposed to humans than domesticated animals. We don't give them names, we don't coddle them, nor do they depend on us for food and walks. This particular duck, however, did share a home with us and she did depend on us for sustenance. I suspect that it is this rupture of the clear line between wild and domesticated that made my housemates and me debate our ethical responsibilities after the attack that left the duck injured and disabled. Shocked and under pressure to relieve the duck from her pain, we discussed all the options we could think of. We could simply not intervene, which would let the duck either recuperate or die a dignified death without additional stress that we would cause by our intervention. Another option briefly addressed was actually to help the duck pass on straight away, even using her body as, as food for the dogs who lived with us. Imagining Nika's body being eaten by other animals caused me great pain, whereas it almost felt to me as if it made sense that we serve a duck, a dead duck to the dogs. But um, of these emo um, but both of these emotions are completely anthropocentric. Perhaps most striking, however, was the fact um, was the fact that killing the duck was made an option early on in our conversation. Perhaps this was because death is understood as a relief from suffering, or perhaps it was because caring for someone is seen as a burden. At this stage, we had no idea whether whether we were dealing with uh, a temporary injury or expecting to care for a long term disabled animal. Um, as the result of our discussion, we decided to intervene, remove the duck from the others and bring her inside, providing human ways of care to her, keeping her wound clean, her body warm and her environment quiet and dark. We were hoping she would survive and not die from the additional strain we were putting on her through intervening. Friends and family who, whom we have told about the incident univocally supported the and even applauded us for caring for this animal. Whereas with Nika, many people judged our actions as ridiculous or even cruel. Not a single doubt from outsiders was voiced with regards um, to what we were doing with and to the duck. Mm. Interestingly, just yesterday, I came across a new project dedicated, um, uh, dedicated to radical companionship by Ayana good fellow, which gives um, words to the approach that I usually try to take when, when relating to others. And the concept of radical companionship describes exactly what I have been trying to express with my writing about uh, the relationship to Nika and the duck and really kind of all animals that I shared dwellings with over the years. So this is now a quote from, from the website um, about radical companionship. The website is just called radicalcompanionship.com. I think it's quite a new project, um, it's kind of up and coming. There's also a book um, yeah, being published soon. So radical companionship, as Ayana Goodfellow writes, uh, is a developing theory for evolving our relationships with others through an anti-species utopian lens. The ideas behind uh, radical companionship generally focus on human non-human relationships, particularly those we share with companion animals or animals colonized into pethood. At a basic level, radical companionship is a way of creating thoughtful interspecies relationships in a way that evokes liberation-oriented principles. Radical companionship is flexible and to an extent vague. So there's lots of space for growth and additional thought. This theory is a refusal of the binary dualism between humans and non-humans. I wish to embrace the chaos of multi-species anarchy." End quote. So what I wrote about in, in the abstract I read to you was um, only one aspect of the many, many ways um, 
the animals and I related to each other. This is, was a very succinct summary of the time I spent with Nika and the duck, who, by the way, after many weeks in isolation, expressed very clearly her need to return to, to her family and so was reintroduced successfully. I was definitely guided by a version of radical companionship as defined by Ayana. However, I could still not completely dislodge myself from the traditional human animal divide and found myself being subjected to all kinds of questioning, evaluating and at times passing of judgment on topics such as the quality of life of the animals, my ethics and my sanity. We also kept reevaluating the extent of responsibility for the animals' lives and deaths and the necessary amount of intervention. I also noticed a continuous change in feelings for the animals I cared for. To what extent did I care for them because my local and temporal trajectory in life overlapped with theirs? And to what extent did I build a friendship, perhaps even a loving relationship with both, both those individuals? To explore, to explore these questions, I find it useful to think about the concept of humanness. I think um, it has a lot to do with how we learn to, to dehumanize some individuals, to elevate the status and moral consideration of others through a process of comparing them against each other. I like to do this little exercise with my audiences to point out how deeply entrenched the, the intersection of ableism and speciesism really is in our minds. So let us think about humanness. Uh, what makes us human? Um, kind of, is there something that distinguishes um, humans from other species? What makes humans different, different from a stone or a plant or a squid? Um, take a moment and without judging your own thoughts, reflect on that question. Uh, what makes you specifically human? We all kind of get um, our own ideas. Um, are you thinking about uh, biological specificities, perhaps spiritual ones, any specific capabilities that only humans might have? Perhaps these are some um, that might come to mind. The capacity to feel and to express feelings such as grief, pain, joy the capacity to communicate, use vocabulary and understand grammatical structures. Our anatomy, our human specific physiology, our body's biochemistries, the concept of reason, reflection, planning, the idea of an economy and the exchange of goods, the production of technologies, a sense of spirituality and feeling part of something bigger, maybe faith, this is a list of what Eurocentric patriarchy teaches us to be uh, specifically human features. It is obviously incredibly flawed and it pinpoints the intersection of speciesism and ableism very well. Firstly, because examples of all of those, uh, such as communication, feelings, reason, etc., they can be found amongst non-human species as well. And secondly, because the way humans embody and express these items, these, these characteristics, varies greatly um, and not everyone has who was assigned to the human species can or wants to comply with these characteristics. Thus, these features are not, not specifically human. Nonetheless, in Eurocentric society, we do tend to think of these features as distinctly human or at least more human than animal. This is so because from a very early age, dominant society teaches us to categorize everything we perceive into systems of hierarchies, where what we code as human traits are given more moral consideration and value than animal traits, whatever these might be. Of course, these hierarchies are dependent on the time and place we find ourselves in. Mel Y. Chen shows in their work on um, animacies Bio biopolitics, racial mattering, and queer affect, how we create grammatical structures of hierarchical ordering, giving most value to the subjects that we are familiar with, the ones that uh, are best represented and most dominant in our communities. And we animalize and objectify others who are less relevant to our lived, lived experience. This rings true across most languages. Who is more or less represented depends on the circumstances we find ourselves in and the languages that we speak and the location that we occupy. 
I am speaking for, from a Eurocentric patriarchal capitalist point of view, where uh, the most represented and familiar body is that of the um, able, abled white cis man. We are experiencing a growth in awareness at the moment where, where we are coming to understand that the hierarchies that place him at the forefront of representation are socially constructed. Social constructs can be um, disassembled and reassembled and changed and discarded. However, even though we are slowly coming to understand that these hierarchies are social, we still very much assume that the discrimination that follows these hierarchies is natural. The under and misrepresentation, exclusion and disregard for anyone who cannot or will not assimilate and, and present as the archetype of able white cis human man is still very much naturalized, a fact of nature fixed by the laws uh, of the hard sciences and thus unchangeable. This becomes most obvious when examining the mechanisms of dehumanization and objectification and ableism and speciesism. Discrimination against non-normative cognitive and bodily abilities and non-normative species belonging is so difficult to identify because differences in ability and species are still naturalized and so the exclusion from dominant uh, society goes unnoticed and is justified, obviously falsely justified. Similar to other natural differences such as those of the color of our eyes or our skin, differences in ability as well as species are natural. They occur in nature, they are not necessarily manufactured. However, the superiority of one individual over another based on this natural difference is indeed manufactured. The artifice of this system becomes clear when we distinguish between the medical model and the social model of understanding disability. The medical model holds that um, a disability is the result of a physical condition that causes the, the affected individual to experience and a decreased quality of life. This model makes disability a biological and thus intrinsic part of, of the disabled person. It naturalizes the circumstances, placing the focus of the narrative on a lack the person is or organically experiencing from within. Uh, this train of thought assumes a normative state, one that is more complete and better, and one that the disabled person diverges from. The social model of disability, however, acknowledges the natural differences between people, but in turn shows, in turn shows that uh, people are, they are disabled, they are made less able by the environment they are placed in. This approach does not assume disability to be a lack or fault compared to, norm to normative bodies and minds, but rather acknowledges that barriers are created by society. The focus here lies not on the disabled person to prove their disability or their willingness and ability to overcome that what disables them, but rather uh, on the normative represented and dominant part of society to make life more accessible and inclusive for all. Following the medical model, disability, bodily non-conformity, abnormality, and a misfitting into one's environment and capitalism are constructed as impairments and drawbacks, a lack. Disability is pathologized and so becomes something that is to be treated with different forms of therapy in order to be cured or otherwise overcome. This also means then that the responsibility is placed with the disabled person to become abled enough to participate in society instead of society to become inclusive enough to make our social political infrastructures accessible to disabled people, um, for dehumanized people and for individuals of other species. So Nora Taylor makes clear the fallacy of this medical understanding of disability by, juxt by juxtaposing the concepts of cognitive empathy and learned adjustment. So we have cognitive empathy and learned adjustment. With the cognitive empathy approach to disability, an able-bodied person will assume and imagine what, what it would be like to be disabled. But as Taylor reminds us, quote, this imagining might not be accurate, and more important, it is only possible with disabilities and injuries which we ourselves are familiar with, ones that are diagnosable and recognizable with our, within our culture. 
end quote. So ones that have already been named, defined and discovered by dominant culture. Whereas within a learned adjustment approach towards disability, to put it very simply, the able-bodied person will refrain from assumptions about the disabled person they encounter and instead adjust their behavior to ac accommodate the other person. It is this medical model based on cognitive empathy that makes room for the idea that disability and animal and animality are comparable as we measure ability based on the performance criteria that are constructed as specifically neurotypical, able-bodied and human in our society. A growing number of disability and animal activists, including Taylor, urge us to turn our backs on this train of thought, as it is the crux of many rights and personhood debates for and against the ethical consideration of disabled and or animal individuals, and will always lead only to the elevation in, more, in moral status of some and the continued disregard, disregard for others. So for example, an able-bodied chimpanzee or a dolphin are considered highly intelligent and might so be granted more, more status than a cognitively disabled person. There's also an additional layer to the intersection between ableism and speciesism, which becomes obvious when considering examples of uh, how non-human animals are affected by disability, as well as how humans are disabled for caring about non-humans. Animals in captivity, this can also include our companion animals, are routinely pa pathologized and diagnosed with madness when, for example, acting out against their oppressors. Mm, when captive animals become harmful towards the humans that hold them prisoner or when they self-harm, these animals are routinely diagnosed. Either they are put on medication to tame them, make them more manageable, or they are disabled physically by common practices such as debeaking or dehorning, for example. Often, of course, the cheapest option is to kill the resisting animal. Either way, all three scenarios remove agency from the animals and dis disable them. I try not to give descri um, graphic descriptions of violence in my talks, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with common industry practices in, in so-called livestock, in the so-called livestock business. But I would like to draw our attention to farmed animals for a moment. On most farms, bodies that are so far animalized that they are constructed as edible are routinely disabled by either the brutal treatment uh, they experience or the built environments that they find themselves in, as well as hormonal drugs that um, manufactures, uh, that hormonal drugs that manufacture their physiology and anatomy to, man to maximize profit. Um, this quote by Chloe Taylor and Kelly Strathers Manford uh, succinctly, su succinctly summarizes how the animal farming industry contributes uh, to disability of humans and non-humans. Quote, all of this disabling of animals takes place in an industry that pollutes the environment, which can produce further disability in order to produce foods that cause health problems for consumers and hence even more disability. The high rates of repetitive strain injuries and disabling workplace, workplace accidents in slaughterhouses, as well as the psychological harms caused by industrial slaughter of animals are also not noted, are also noted in vegan and animal activist literature. People refusing to participate in this industry are also routinely pathologized. For example, orthorexia nervosa, avoidant restrictive uh, food intake disorder and other kind of selective um, eating disorders are freq frequently diagnosed by medical professionals if one refuses to partake in carnism, the, the speciesist act of uh, consuming the bodies um, of those who have been animalized. And let us not forget that many animal liberation activists bearing witness to the cruelty against animals and disrupting it through, the, through direct action also suffer from the results of um, the trauma that they experience. Not only is this secondary trauma from bearing witness to someone else's suffering, but also do their own bodies have to with, withstand the force of those securing the continuation of animal industries such as farmers or livestock uh, lorry drivers, 
zoo and aquarium keepers and animal trainers and circuses and the law enforcement securing their businesses to run smoothly. Not rarely, not rarely judicial, judicially the structures are in place um, to also long-term criminalize activists who, who are then removed from society and long-term incapacitated. Further experiences like these then lead to PTSD, anxiety, um, panic and depression, for example. Okay, so where does this insight into the processes that disable um, and dehumanize individuals, no matter of what spe species, leave us? In capitalist Eurocentric patriarchy, a lot of anti-discrimination and inclusion work is advocating for rights and personhood of those ostracized, violated and injured by dominant society. Following the logic of rights and personhood, those who are human enough are granted rights to influence the shape and form of the society they live in. The idea is then that we as individuals have to prove that we are human enough, capable enough to make these decisions about our own lives and gain grounds to actively participate in shaping the communities we want to live in. We have to prove that, that we have the capacity to express ourselves enough to be understood understood by the dominant culture. In other words, we have to assimilate to be considered of moral value and to be given agency and access. Assimilation is not the process of making equal, but rather the process of homogenization, of becoming the same. When we assimilate ourselves or when we are assimilated, we camouflage our differences in thought. We hide our bodies, we deny our perception of the world and our own desires in favor of being perceived as more human and so being granted more agency. It is precisely this mechanism that lies at the essence of masking and brings us full circle back to the beginning of my talk. Disability and animal liberation activists and scholars offer many philosophical um, and concretely infrastructural solutions to dismantle and uh, undo ableist and speciesist oppression, but it is up to those who are privileged by these systems to relinquish their positions of power and give up, that, give up their space. Thank you.